Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, January 14th, 2017. This is episode 1354. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step by step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte is here. Oh, wait, I'm talking about myself in the third person. I am <laughs> Leo Laporte. I hate it when people do that. The tech guy. I hate it when that Leo Laporte does that. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the <clears throat> phone number to call. The tech guy. 888-827-5536. And what can I talk about? Well, anything with a chip in it, anything... You know, technology-wise, computers, the internet, home theater. We talk about digital photography. We talk about smartphones, smart watches, virtual reality, augmented reality. <clears throat> eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Eight 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 two seven five five three six. Glad to have you here. What's news? Let's see. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I guess encryption might be in the news uh, today. Uh, there's a debate, uh, of course, over the Trump dossier. And I don't bring that up for any other reason except to mention that one of the pieces in the Trump dossier implied that a what, uh, widely considered secure messaging program, Telegram, had been uh, cracked by the FSB, the Russian Security Services, uh, that the that the uh, encryption uh, was cracked, and that's important because uh, uh, Telegram was invented by a Russian, Pavel Durov. He was considered by many to be the Facebook, the Mark Zuckerberg of Russia, the Facebook billionaire of Russia. He actually left Russia in exile after uh, he was forced to sell his uh, Facebook clone to the Russian government <clears throat> for a value he didn't consider realistic. And so he ran, ran off and created Telegram, which was a, uh, an encrypted messaging service. Now, the reason uh, I, I bring this up is it, I think a lot of people are looking for ways to share with family and friends in a private way. I don't think you all are terrorists. I don't think terrorists listen to this show. They got they got other things to do. I think you're quite reasonably just a normal uh, American citizen or citizen of another land, since we are heard all over the world that wants to preserve their privacy. Now, obviously, in some countries, this is more than a this is a life and death matter. It's more than just a convenience. But everybody should have the right to have private communications, right? So uh, we talk about this a lot. We talk about how you can use messaging programs safely. And, uh, you know, Telegram was one that uh, people were using. I have actually, uh, while I love Telegram and I use it, I've always said that the best you can say about Telegram is it has good enough encryption, good enough for casual use. The reason is it uses a non-standard encryption protocol that they invented that has never really been proven uh, completely reliable. So if it has been cracked, and that we don't know, but if it has been cracked, maybe not a huge surprise. Telegram says we haven't been cracked. Uh, that's referring to somebody intercepting the F SMS message that people use to, uh, to enable Telegram. Okay, fine. WhatsApp, another app a lot of people use. It's owned by Facebook now. It also promises encrypted messaging. And there was a story this week. This, this is all of a piece. There was a story this week that WhatsApp had been cracked. Now, the folks who do the encryption for WhatsApp, the highly respected um, Open Whisper Systems folks, one of the guy's names, the kind of the head of the group is Moxie Marlinspike. I'm thinking not his real name, but <laughs> hey, if you're creating encryption tools, you probably don't want to be too public about who you really are. Uh, Open Whisper Systems responded this morning, no, 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 that's a misunderstanding. Uh, it is, in fact, secure. 
And then uh, they make a program signal, Open Whisper Systems does, that everybody agrees is safe to use and secure. So if they say WhatsApp is also secure, I think I would trust them. It uses the Open Whisper software. Um, and then, uh, so if you want to message securely, uh, I think Facebook's messaging, which I believe also uses the signal system, WhatsApp uh, or Signal, those are all still secure and safe even from government snooping. Just a, you know, a little public service announcement. If you want to use encrypted email, my recommendation is still GPG or PGP. And a lot of people go, oh, why, why, do you, why, why would you even bother, Leo? Who cares about this? Fine. Just understand messaging as it stands, even messaging on Apple's platform, and email as it stands, uh, unless you take additional steps to secure it, is insecure. It's like sending a postcard. Just, you know, word of warning, which means that not it's not merely governments, hackers, bad guys, snoops can all intercept and read what you're doing. Just it's a public service announcement. Consider it that. Uh, and I will, of course, keep up on this and let you know if uh, we learn any more. But as as of right now, I'm satisfied that WhatsApp is safe to use in the encrypted mode. Facebook Messenger in the encrypted mode. Maybe a little less safe, but uh using the same technology and signal would be my first choice <clears throat> problem with all these of course you got to get other people to use it the nice thing about whatsapp and facebook is people are already using those in many cases email is another matter it's a little more complicated you got to use pgp or gpg that's what i use to sign it and encrypt it and you have to exchange keys with whoever you want to talk with and that's complicated but again uh, you know i think privacy is a right Consumer Reports changed their mind. <laughs> oh, boy. Remember, uh, Consumer Reports at first tested the new MacBook Pros and said, oh, the battery life is so wildly inconsistent. Uh, we, just don't, uh, we just don't recommend it. Big blow to Apple. It's the first time Consumer Reports has not recommended a MacBook, a Mac laptop, in a long time, in living memory. Um, Apple responded to Consumer Reports, said, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Consumer Reports said, oh, so we are. They've now revised their battery tests. They say uh, in multiple tests, all three new MacBook Pros performed well with one running 18 and three quarters hours on a charge. And so we recommend them. I'm not sure I recommend them, but I don't. I haven't done any thorough testing. I just know that my new MacBook Pro, I got the 15-inch. My wife got the 13-inch. Neither of them are consistent in how they use battery. And I guess that's kind of the problem is that sometimes it will only go for two hours on a charge. And sometimes it'll go for six. I've never gotten 18. That's, I don't know. How, the problem with all battery tests is they're uh, what we call synthetic. They're not really real world. In the case of Consumer Reports, they just keep loading web pages via Wi-Fi until the battery dies. And that's certainly one of the things you do on a computer, but it's not the only thing you do. So, eh, eh, eh. I, uh, my real-world experience with the MacBook Pros is not great battery life. But I, on the other hand, that's true of all laptops, and it's always wildly inconsistent, unless you do exactly the same thing each time. And even then, I think it's inconsistent. Stuff runs in the background and so forth. So, uh... But if, if Consumer Reports is your go-to on, on hardware to buy, they now recommend the MacBook Pro. I'm not crazy about the touch bar. I really, I think I've mentioned this. I just really don't like it. I, I hit it by accident all the time, which means Siri pops up or Spotlight or something every time. I wish I could get rid of that touch bar. I like the fingerprint reader, the Touch ID. That's great. I like the power, and it's the, only, it's the most powerful laptop Apple, Apple offers. You can't get rid of the touch bar without getting rid of some of that speed. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. Uh, anything else big? Let me just check my... You know, I go through this every day. I go through the tech news, look for stories that are important. U.S. appeals court has revived an antitrust lawsuit against Apple. What? Uh, th th this is interesting. Consumers... Suing Apple saying, uh, you monopolize the mar market for iPhone apps because we can only get them from Apple or through Apple's store, and that's a monopoly. And the appeals court ruled that that's a legitimate suit. They didn't rule on the suit, just that 
that challenge can go forward. I don't know if that's the solution to that is to have a non-Apple app store. That sounds like a recipe for disaster, too. On the other hand, it is kind of monopoly. It's kind of the definition of monopoly. You can only buy your stuff from us. Phones next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Michael Cozio at the piano playing the tunes. 8888-ASK-LEO. 888-8255-36. Say again? Crystal. No, no, I talked to him. It's Michael. Crystal's there too. Crystal Persuasion, we call her. Uh, I just want to thank YouTube and all and the Academy or whatever. I just got a box from YouTube with a big silver play button in it. I didn't even know this. We have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit, T W I T for our uh, podcast network. Had it all along. I always thought of it kind of more as a, um, you know, kind of a publicity stunt rather than a moneymaker. But they just sent me a beautiful framed silver button for uh, surpassing 100,000 subscribers. That's pretty nice. We have 111,213 subscribers right now. Uh, this show's on that network. Although what, the way we did it, and uh, people, when we did it, said, oh, you're going you're gonna to be sorry you did this because you're, you're diluting your YouTube channel. We, we created a bunch of additional channels, one for each of the podcasts we do, including the Tech Eye, which has its, uh, its own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash, I don't know what, Tech Guy Labs. That's it, youtube.com slash Tech Guy Labs. That only has 15,000 subscribers. You know, and I don't even know what it really means to subscribe to YouTube. It just, it just means what? You get an email or a notification when there's a new video out. That's the main thing. So uh, that's nice. Thank you, YouTube, for that. Uh, <laughs> Have you seen the Psycho Dad series? The one where the, you know, the dad gets upset at his kid for playing video games all day and takes the video games and puts them on the lawn and mows them with his riding mower. You know, they scream at each other. It's actually, a, you know, it's all, I hope I'm not ruining anything for you, but it's all, you know, an act. The guy's name McJuggernuggets. And uh, did, he, did he not retire from YouTube recently, McJuggernuggets? I think they ended that channel. But uh, he took his silver play button... And he put it on eBay. Now, I, I promise you, YouTube, that, well, I shouldn't promise. But, uh, you know, unless I'm destitute on the street. <laughs> I, actually, he's selling it on eBay. It's the silver play button that uh, he shattered, I guess, on the uh, video. And so far, the bids are $90,000. Uh, oh, uh, I, I take it all back. <clears throat> it's suddenly for sale. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow they're giving they've reached a billion views on that you know that's the probably the views number is more important isn't it 8888 ask leo oh look look who should i should share my silver play button with heather Hammond, <laughs> the phone ranger hello heather hey yeah when you get to gold i'll take that silver one <laughs> uh <clears throat> you're bundled up is it freezing in there you've got your fur lined snowsuit on it's a little cold and it was what 39 in petaluma this morning yeah. so yeah. still when we say that you know though there are many people around the country who are going <laughs> amateurs <Yeah. laughs> uh hey we're we're, we, we're from california we have thin blood now we exactly. can't we can't take the cold anymore it's besides you look fetching as a snow bunny in your snowsuit you can't go wrong with fur yeah a little fur trim. That's probably faux fur. That's another thing you can't do in California. <laughs> Wear fur. That's crazy talk. So uh, you've been lining up the calls all morning, sure slaving have. over a hot phone. Who should I start Blowing with? up. Um, Scott in Orange County who says he's been trying to get through for a month. <laughs> well, it's hard, right? There's a lot, you know, there's like, well, we know now there's 100,000 people subscribed. <laughs> Actually, it's more like 11,000, but it's hard to get through. So I'm glad you did, Scott. Thank you, uh, Heather. Welcome to the Tech Guy Show. Hi, Scott. How's it going? I'm well. How are you? A beautiful day in Orange County. Oh, yeah. Rub it in. <laughs> it's always a beautiful day in Orange County. That's true. Yeah. Hey, so I've been, I've been trying to get in for a month because this is perplexing me. Um, I've got all Apple stuff, uh, and um, when I... 
I, it's been two years where my internet goes from 20 megabit with what we're paying for down to like one megabit or below. And I was on the phone to Apple and, and all the router people and nobody could figure it out. I, you know, I thought it was the ISP, you know, this is complicated because it, it, you know, it could be everybody involved. Right. So uh, here's the process you can go through to try to narrow it down. First of all, the ISP will point out that we say up to 20 megabits guaranteed, right? Up to. They never say we guarantee 20 megabits unless you pay a lot more money. So uh, one sounds a little low if you've been getting 20. Are you on a cable modem or a, a phone line, DSL? Uh, yeah, cable. But cable. hey, I, I got the solution. I figured it out. Oh. Right? And, uh, so the iPhone, when it's when it's on the Wi-Fi system, it's backing up all the videos that I take with my iPhone. I got the new iPhone 7 Plus, right? And so it's uploading all those files to uh, Apple. And also I've got a Google app that it's backing up too, right? And then it, but it brings my whole system to a crawl. That can happen. So turn, that can and happen. And I turn it off. I turn it off. It comes right back up. So and it's up. It's remember. uploads. It's a. It's a lot of uploading that's slowing it down. Yeah. So how does the upload kill your whole download in your whole house? Hey, that's a really uploading. good. That's a great question. People don't really know this. So this is a good factoid that every time when you're downloading, every few bytes, every packet or so. Actually, it's every packet. Uh, the the server you're downloading f from asks for an acknowledgement from you, which is uploaded to them. Did you get it? Okay, I'll send the next one. Did you get it? Okay, I'll send the next one. If your upstream is clogged up, busy doing something else, then that slows down the acts, the acknowledgements, and slows down the downloads. So you can saturate, if you saturate your upstream, your uploads, it will slow down your downloads. Now, I should point out that that is really bad behavior of any program on a phone or on a computer or anywhere to, to saturate your upload uh, stream. That's not nice. Programs uh, that use the Internet, like Carbonite's a good example, Carbonite Backup, will be what we call the technical term, believe it or not, is nice. They'll be nice. They won't overuse. They won't hog resources understanding that others might be using them. So Carbonite, you know, if you look on the upload won't use all your bandwidth. It'll only use a fraction of it. Uh, and that's what the iPhone should do. I'm kind of surprised that uh, the iPhone is using up all your bandwidth. That that doesn't sound right. I guess maybe the problem is if you're using multiple applications. So if you have many applications, but each is using a fraction of the total, they could add up to more than you've got. What is your upstream? What, are the, what does your cable provider say your upstream is? It's two. Two megabits. Yeah, see, that's so low that it probably is easy to saturate it. Do you have any bit torrents running or anything? See, there's also things that you may not realize are using your upstream, like your email program. Do you run bit torrents of any kind? No. Tor no torrents. torrents. When you download torrents, one of the features, unless you disable it, is to start up offering the same torrent for upload. That's how bit torrents work. It's a peer to peer system. So people start downloading your copy of the thing you downloaded. You can turn that off or th throttle it, and that's a good feature. I don't know of anything to do that you can do to throttle uh, your phone's uh, applications, though. Maybe somebody else does. Keep listening. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Here's the man with all the vision. That's because he's our home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson. <laughs> Back from CES. What was your total? Uh, 25 and a half miles. Jeez Louise. And <laughs> and you don't go try to see everything, do you? This is I, There's no way. <laughs> so this is just really kind of sticking in the home theater section. Well, yeah. I spent most of my time in, what, in the central hall of the convention center, which encompasses in total more than 2 million square feet. Good Lord. <laughs> I spent some time in the north hall, which is interesting, because usually that's all automotive stuff. But uh, this year... Le Eco, one of the big Chinese brands that's really coming on strong, they were there with TVs. And uh, JVC, which most of their booth was automotive stuff as well, but they had a little corner where they had some new projectors. So that was really fun. Yeah. So uh, we talked a little last week, but now that you've had time to digest it and to recover, 
What or, what are what are your thoughts about CES? <laughs> I mean, one thing I noted was that uh, no no plasmas, no new technologies. It's really boiled down now to LCDs and uh, OLEDs, and a number of companies trying to obfuscate this all with. Yeah, with, like QLED and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sam, with, Samsung really, really uh, tried to obfuscate things with this term QLED. That's not an OLED. That's a regular LCD. It's a regular LCD that uses quantum dots in the backlight system. Now, the term QLED has come to mean to many of us uh, that point in the future when we will have a TV in which the light-emitting part, the, the color light-emitting part, is quantum dots. Yeah. That's not the way it is right now. The quantum dots are just used to help create a white light that passes through an LCD panel and color filters. I, I feel like the words quantum dots even are a little bit misleading. I mean, that well, makes it sound very modern and space-age. No, there, there are technical reasons why that's a valid name. Okay. Basically, but they're really LEDs. Well, are they? No, quantum dots are not. They are quantum dots. They are microscopic nanoparticles wow. of a semiconductor material, okay. typically on the order of two to five nanometers in diameter. And when you make them out of a certain material, you hit them with, say, blue light. They absorb the blue light and then re-radiate either red or green, depending upon the size of the quantum dot. Oh, that's cool. It's very cool, and and we saw an, a very strong appearance of this technology at CES. It's becoming more and more common because it gives you a wider range of colors, which is important, um, and uh, a more defined spectrum of red, green, and blue without a lot of overlap between them. So and a backlit... A screen with quantum dots, what would be the advantage? You still just want a white light, right? You don't need correct, quantum. correct. And what they do is they have a blue, they have instead of white LEDs back there, they have blue LEDs. And then they have a film that has been impregnated with these quantum dots of two sizes. One size emits red and one size oh. emits green when it's hit with blue light from these blue LEDs. And so the blue light hits this film. The quantum dots radiate red and green, depending on the size. They're randomly distributed in this film. And then some of the blue light from the LEDs gets through. It does not get absorbed. So the blue light from the LEDs combines with the red and green light from the quantum dots makes white. Is it just a f very elaborate way to make white, or is there an advantage? There's a serious advantage. What's a that? serious advantage. The yeah. advantage is a wider range of colors, what's called wide color gamut. And isn't white, white just white? Yes, but if you take uh, if is you it take a better a, white, it's a better white. It, ha it it is a better white. When you take a look at white light and you analyze it with a spectrum analyzer, you can see where the peaks and valleys are in the spectrum from red to blue. Yeah, I'm a man. White is white. I don't have this eggshell, <laughs> vanilla, all these different no, kinds of yeah, whites. No, 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 no. That's no, no. true. That's okay, true. Okay, but I understand but, what you're saying. So this is a pure. A white with a broader with range of colors so correct, you can separate correct. better more colors out of yes, it. Yes, exactly so. Okay. Exactly okay. so. And this is very important in in the area of what's called high dynamic range where you have a greater range of brightness levels from black to white and that's a very big thing these days. When you do that, you need a wider range of colors as well. Uh, in order so that as the picture gets brighter, you still have saturated colors. Wow. In the current scheme, standard dynamic range, as you get brighter, the range of colors gets desaturated and kind of converges on white. Uh, it does that in high dynamic range too, but if you have a greater brightness range where you can have strong colors, you're going to have a much, much better picture. However, however, there are other ways to achieve a similar effect without quantum dots, right? Well, no? yeah. Yeah, there is. OLEDs okay. do it as well. OLED okay. TVs okay. do that as well. Okay. Um, laser projectors. And we saw quite a few, interestingly, we saw quite a few laser illuminated projectors that are what are called ultra short throw. So they're these boxes and they sit maybe six inches or a foot from the wall and they shoot up onto the wall, hopefully onto a screen, not just a white painted wall and give you a 100-inch or 120 or 140-inch image uh, without needing a 
a, an LCD TV or an OLED TV, which would be prohibitively expensive at that size. Ah, that's the issue, right? OLED, they haven't really been able to improve the manufacturing yields so that they can get bigger that, screens and yep. lower cost, which normally happens with this kind of thing. So Exactly. And, L and OLED TV prices have come down. Yeah. Uh, or, to, to put it another way, uh, LG's 2017 OLEDs are no more expensive than last year's when they first came out. Well, that's not coming down. Well, that's just it, not going it is up. Because, because, last, <laughs> because, because they're better. Oh, they're Wait, better. Okay. They're it's more, better. More better, less, but no, less, no more but money. no less money. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. ones from last year are quite a bit less expensive. Oh, that's good. Is so, Q, Amiga Pi asks a good question in the chat room. Is QLED yeah. better than OLED? I would say no. Okay. Um, and is OLED still the best I think screen so. you could get? Okay. In my opinion, yes. How about uh, the? What else did you see that we have about a minute left that mm -hmm. that you really blew your mind? Those projectors, they sound good. Although I bet you those are still very expensive. They right? are. They're in the fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollar range. Um, let's see. I love the Quantum really thin. Was it LG oh. that did a? LG, the W7, the wallpaper OLED. How thick this, was that? I said the amount, and people said, no, that can't be. Oh, it, the TV itself is less than three millimeters thick. See, somebody said, no, that must be centimeters. No, it's three no, no, no. Millimeters. millimeters. And they have a mount system where you put it on the wall, and there's less than four millimeters from the wall to the front of the screen. So it almost so, is your wall. It almost is. I mean, a, four just millimeters a wall is like, I mean. It's not very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Is it's that amazing. a backlit LCD? No, no, it's an OLED. It has OLED. to be OLED because OLED is emissive. Exactly. You don't have a backlight, and that adds thickness. There's no backlight, okay. exactly. Okay. We will get a quantum dot display that's emissive that has no backlight. That's a few years away yet. Yeah. And when we do, then that may very well take the OLED, the crown away from OLED. So somebody says, the takeaway here is there's nothing new for Leo to buy this year. <laughs> right? Uh, no, there's a no. new, new Ultra HD Blu-ray player. I have, but uh, don't I have a, a one in my uh, PlayStation? You have one in your, S, in your Xbox. Xbox, but Xbox it, One X. It doesn't do Dolby Vision. Dolby Vision High Dynamic Range has come out strong this year. Yeah, that strong. does HDR10, right? There's three Correct. standards. Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dolby it's Vision so is much better. But this is good for... Shut up. This is good for... <laughs> this is good for business. Scott Wilkinson, he's our home theater geek at twit.tv slash h. TG. You also find him at the AVS Forum, avsforum.com, and every week right here. Every week right here. Right here. <laughs> Talking oh, about TV. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Four millimeters is 0.15748 of an inch, says Fred Bloggs. Ten, ten, a little more than tenth of an inch. Yeah. Wow. It's a, it, that was really astonishing. To see that. So you really think I should go out and get a Blu-ray UHD player with Dolby HDR? It's better. Dolby Vision. Dolby Vision. Yeah, I I do. I think, and it's not that expensive. You're going to find them in the, you know, $300, $400 range. It's not that bad. Um, we don't have any Ultra HD Blu-ray discs with Dolby Vision yet, but there were several studios announced that they were going to start producing them and releasing them. Wow. And the advantage of Dolby Vision over HDR10 is something called dynamic metadata. Oh. And what that does, metadata basically is carrying information along with the audio and video signal that says, how was this content uh, mastered? What was the peak brightness that was, mas that, it, that was the mastering monitor that it was used to create this? But more importantly, what was the peak brightness in each scene? Wow. All the way down to in each frame. Oh, my goodness. And that way, the TV can adjust itself automatically to reproduce the entire dynamic range of each scene rather than saying, well, you know, at, at one hour, 20 minutes into this movie, there's a super bright thing. And that's the, the brightest thing in this whole movie this is what HDR10 does. And that's it. And so everything else can look a little weird because it th there's no reference. There's only a reference for the entire program, not for each scene. And if there were for each scene, you, you get a much better result. Hmm. You get a much better result. So we're gonna, we do already have Dolby Vision content coming from Vudu, Netflix, and Amazon streaming. 
Uh, and we will see Ultra HD Blu-ray discs with Dolby Vision HDR on them this year. I have no doubt of it whatsoever. So there you go. I'll let you have it for a couple minutes. You can be here at the top of the hour? Yeah, happy to. All righty. Take it away. <clears throat> Thanks. Marsworm is asking, can't Dolby Vision come in firmware? Probably not. And the reason is it requires a, a certain amount of processing power. Now, Sony just introduced at CES that they have added Dolby Vision to their TVs. First time that they've done that. But they have a super powerful processor inside their TVs called the X1 Extreme. And uh, that has the power to do Dolby Vision. So they will be able to do it with a firmware update. But if a TV doesn't have that kind of processing power, it, it needs to upgrade its hardware. And you, you're not going to do that with a with a current TV. Um, <clears throat> UJ said, I heard that LG's W's ribbon cable isn't up to code. I hadn't heard that, but that is one part of the lay it flat against the wall kind of thing is what are you going to do with the cables? You still need to have cables, at least a, a, some sort of connector cable, a signal cable, and a power cable. And uh, LG and Samsung both introduced really thin, uh, almost invisible cables to take care of that so that you don't really see it. I mean, it's there, but you can, I think, paint over it or, or something like that. Uh, as to whether or not it's up to code, that I don't know. That's a, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, Battle Camp, did I see any good AV receivers under 1,000 with Dolby Atmos, specifically from Onkyo? CES isn't the show at which receivers are normally introduced. Uh, so the answer is no, I didn't. But I was looking more at video than audio anyway. Stick uh, around. Top of the hour yep. coming up, and uh, we'll yep. see more Scott then. So save your you betcha. AV questions. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. Website, techguylabs.com. That's a good thing to keep in mind. We put all the links and everything up there. Uh, audio and video after the show goes up there. If in case you miss a show, you can catch it there. Uh, what else? Um, oh, your comments, too. If you have a thought, <laughs> if you disagree, uh, put them there. Um, it's free to uh, visit. There's no sign-up. But if you want to leave comments, we do ask you to... Uh, sign up. You can use your Facebook, or your Google, or you know your various different accounts to make it easy to sign up. But we do want to do that just to prevent spam. That's all. Techguylabs.com. Michael is next. He's in Eastvale, California. Hi, Michael. Hi, Leo. Hi, Leo. Hey, who's that? Those are my little ones. Ah, what are their names? Uh, Madeline and Isabella. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Isabella. <laughs> are you all on the way to somewhere? Yeah, we're actually headed up to see some snow right now if we can. Without going nice. Up. Nice. I hear there's a little bit in the mountains. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of snow up there right now. Yes, there is. What can I do for you? Hey, my question is, uh, I just recently started looking into mobile photo printers, yeah. and I want to get your take on it. The, the one I did a little bit more research than others was the HP Sprocket. Yep. And it seems like a good little printer. It's, it's uh, portable. It's rechargeable. The, the ink is on the paper. But I know there's some other options. I want to get you take what you feel is maybe the best one to go in. Yeah, with. this is a hot category right now. These it's for. Uh, I take it that Isabel and Madeline are like their uh, like Instagram and stuff. Yeah. Not as much as Dad. I, dad I, I, is in Instagram. Instagram. Oh, <laughs> it's this is for Dad, huh? Uh, so this sprocket is cool. It's uh, it's kind of an it's an instant printer, right? So as you said, the uh, there's no ink. You buy the paper. It's kind of like buying a Polaroid. Uh, in fact, Polaroid has one too. They call their Zip. Same idea. Um, and in theory, these printers uh, are going to give you actually better photo prints. They work more like the you know the prints that you would get at a drugstore or at a Photoshop, because it's using a dye sublimation technology that gives you a nice vivid colors and they're glossy i don't have any uh, direct experience uh, with any of these the only thing i would caution you is they can add up because when you know just like polaroid film right you when, you, when you're buying this you, you're it's expensive um we're talking maybe a buck or more a print so you should always check the cost of what we call the consumables 
So the Polaroid, for instance, for 15 bucks, uh, you can get uh, a 30 pack. So that's 50 cents each. I'm not sure what the zinc um, paper costs, the zinc photo paper. But just remember that you have to buy it from that company forever at whatever price they charge. And 50 cents is exactly. a too, 50 cents is not too bad. You know, I love the yeah. idea about this. You can carry it in your pocket. I mean, they're literally that small. And uh, and it's fun for parties, for events. People like getting prints. Um, so I think there's a lot of use for this. I do, what I don't know is how long these will last. They're not, I don't think, using Polaroid-style technology. Remember, Polaroids, you're, if you're old enough to remember Polaroids, they would they would fade and uh, after time. I, don't, I would guess this is not the case. I would guess this is... Uh, more like a die sub printer and which should last a long time. Zinc paper is also 50 cents, I'm told. Um, and, and the other thing to note is how, if you look at it, these are smaller than you think. The zinc prints two by three, two inches by three inches. So just keep that in mind. It's not, uh, it's not these are not what we would call full-sized shots, right? Um, exactly. By the way, the Polaroid also works with the zinc. So I guess this is, you know, my guess is the Polaroid's probably the same as the zinc. You know, maybe I should buy one of these just to give it a review for you. Yeah. What What would you use it for? What, what What's your idea? Well, I do a lot of Instagram photos, and typically the only way to, to get them printed because it's a compressed file uh, is to usually go off of a website. And it, right. they run quite a bit of money to do it. And they're pretty limited on what they offer. Yeah. Plus, you have to wait till you, uh, you can either download it or they mail them back to you. If you're willing to go a little bit bigger, if you want to carry it in your pocket, the zinc probably is the way to go. If you want to go a little bit bigger, zinc is 130 bucks for under 100 bucks. Canon makes a small wireless compact photo printer. It's a little bit bigger. You know, it's less compact, less expensive. And I think it does larger prints. That's called the selfie with a P-H, S-E-L-P-H-Y. Boy, there's a now, lot of these. Eps the selfie. Are they tied into the social media sites, though? Um, well, yeah, because it just runs software. on. It really, it all ends up being what apps uh, you have. So if, as long as they have apps, which these do, uh, you'll be good. Um, these, uh these will print. The selfie can print 4 by 6 2 by 3 three by four and two by two so you can do a broader range of sizes on this uh i'm not sure how much it costs let's see 33 cents a print so it's a little less expensive on consumables as well i'm looking at a pc magazine review they also review epson's picture mate they have a couple of little ones the fuji instax share this is a big category all of a sudden but the hp zinc is the ones getting all the attention because it's so cute and all, all the kids want one, right? But I would take a look at that Canon selfie as an alternative. Now, does that use ink, or is that also embedded on the paper? S same thing. You use a special... Well, let me see. You know what? That's a good question. Wait a minute. It does look like it uses ink, so let me make sure. That's how they get it so small, right? Uh, iOS and Android, postcards... Uh, um, I, think it, I think it's the paper. The ink is in the paper. But that's, a good, that's a good question, yeah. Um, another editor's choice from PC Magazine, the Epson PictureMate Charm, which is even less, $0.25 cents per page. Oh, Epson's discontinued it, so you're going to have to look around. You may be able to still find it uh, in a lot of places. So the, uh, the PC Magazine's editor's choice, and they really test these things like crazy, is uh, the less expensive Canon Selfie. But I think the Zinc looks pretty cool. I'm going to get a Zinc because I like the name. <laughs> and what? And you're going to hand them out? What are you going to do with them? No, I, just to kind of test out what they look like because they always look different on the screen. After I know, the I know, yeah. Um, and then you know, I have I have used in the past apps that will uh, you do it on the phone and they'll send you a book. Um, yeah. And so if that's if all you were going to do is like put them in a book and put them on the shelf, that might be a. A, a way to go is, is use one of those uh, apps that does that kind of thing. But I, you know, I like this idea. If I think it's most useful, like if you're at an event and you're handing out pictures to people, like that, because yeah. it's instant, right? Yeah, it's perfect. So that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, have fun. All right. Take care. Have fun in the snow, Madeline and Isabel. Are they skiers? 
No, not skiers. We're just going to go up and try and touch what we can without going too high up. Yeah, look, it's snow. Have they ever seen snow? No. Wow. <laughs> it's frozen water, kids. <laughs> it came from the sky. Have fun. It's great to talk to you. Take... They're asking for you to say goodbye to them. <laughs> Bye, girls. Hi, right, Leo. Thank you. All right. Take care. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the... Uh, I'll have to find it. I have the book somewhere, the uh, little book, the thing that'll print from... In it actually is really easy. If Instagram's what you want, it actually will open your Instagram feed. You select the pictures chick -chick -chick with your finger. Touch, touch, touch. It's on the, on the uh, iPhone. And then print. And it's not too expensive. And the nice thing is that now it's a book you can put on the, on the bookshelf. 8888 Ask Leo. If you've got some experience with these, let me know. Website, techguylabs.com. We'll put links to the uh, various printers the little photo printers out there uh and that's where you can find the phone number we'll be back with more calls right after this and now ladies and gentlemen the star of our show <laughs> madeline and isabel no scott Ooh. wilkinson for the next 500 seconds 508 seven, six. Six. <laughs> <laughs> thanks scott um you betcha so, uh, so yeah, we've been talking in the chat room quite a bit here. Uh, MacBookie uh, uh, actually got Samsung to swap out his 2014 TV to a 2016 model uh, when he complained that it wasn't future ready, as they claimed. And I just saw a news story about this that uh, they've been sued uh, and have apparently agreed to either financial compensation or to do what happened to MacBookie of... Uh, swapping out TVs because they said in 2014 they all the electronics and the processing and all that stuff was in a separate box which at that time I believe they called the smart Evo box but now it's called one connect I hate when these companies change their names all over the place but in any event uh, and they said they would update it every year and then they didn't so people complained as they should have and they and Samsung has agreed to uh, to make restitution in one way or another so good for samsung i'm glad they did that i mean bad for them for you know promising something they didn't deliver <clears throat> yo dave says uh, should i use my tv's input for cable roku blu-ray etc and send the sound to the av receiver or should i have all the peripherals first to the receiver instead and the answer is absolutely the latter if possible uh, the receiver, that's what its job is, is to switch between sources. Now, TVs have multiple inputs, HDMI inputs, and you can do that. You can c connect your cable box and Roku and Blu-ray to the TV and then audio out from the TV to the AV receiver. But that would normally be by optical digital audio cable. And that will probably only give you two-channel audio. Uh, it might give you 5.1, but it'll only be Dolby Digital. And Blu-ray, certainly, uh, and Atmos and some of these more advanced audio formats uh, require more than what the optical cable can transmit. Therefore, it's much better to connect your peripherals to the AV receiver and then take the HDMI out from the receiver to the TV. Now, that is uh, uh, predicated on having the having a modern receiver a fairly new receiver that can pass all of the advanced video through it from say the ultra hd blu-ray player or uh roku box or whatever uh to the tv uh, if it can't then you might need to go back to the first way um fortunately some Ultra HD Blu-ray players have two HDMI outputs, which is pretty cool. One of them, pardon me, you can go directly to the TV. The other one goes to the AVR and sends the full audio to the uh, AV receiver. Uh, so that that's a workaround in case the AV receiver is older and can't pass um, 4K, for example, or high dynamic range if your TV can handle it. Um, so that's, that's the caveat there. But generally speaking, you really want to connect your peripherals to the AV receiver. 
Uh, let's see. Battle Cam has got the got the Atmos speaker. Wait, speakers waiting for the receiver. <laughs> Mick asked, uh, OLED or Q QLCD? Actually, QLED is the uh, is the Samsung moniker for Fibby McGee and Molly and the Shadow. No, I would say get a CRT for that. <coughs> Um, let's see. What else can I come up with here? MacBookie's really loving his, uh, KS9500. That's the flagship 78-inch, uh, fall, uh, full array local dimming backlighting, which is, uh, which is really good. I was so disappointed this year that Samsung at the C at CES announced that all of its new 2017 TVs are edge lit. There are none that are full array local dimming, which I always prefer. You know, this QLED, the Q7, Q8, and Q9 flagship are, are all edge lit, um, which I, I don't like. But I didn't, you know, I didn't really take a close look. It's, it's impossible to really judge the quality of a, of a, a video image on the show floor. Bunch of lights, uh, difficult to say. One thing that was kind of interesting, though, about Samsung and LG's LCD TVs, what they call their super UHD TVs, is that they've increased the viewing angle. So, and in particular, the Samsung one is impressive in that regard because they use a type of LCD panel that normally has very poor off-axis response. That is, you're sitting straight on, looks great. Get a little bit off axis, uh, colors start getting washed out, black level rises, contrast decreases. Samsung, the new QLED TVs, have done something interesting with that type of panel called a VA or vertically aligned panel that actually does improve the performance off axis. Now, the way they did it is kind of interesting. They took their red, green, and blue subpixels and split them up. And, and are addressing them somewhat separately. I don't fully understand it yet, but I certainly will at some point soon. And that somehow allows the off-axis performance to improve quite a bit. Um, but it, it might cause a, a little artifact. One, one friend of mine who's a, who is a uh, calibrator, David McKenzie, uh, said that he walked into the Samsung booth and immediately said, is that a quintile display? He 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 saw it immediately. I didn't, um, but then he did a he published an article on hdtvtest.co.uk. Uh, published an article about this pixel structure, and and ha how that's it's a little odd. Um, so you know when we get a close look at it, we'll know for sure what's going on. Uh, but uh, that that was a little bit strange. Let's see. Chris, Chris Key Walker, I've got 100 seconds left. Chris Key Walker says, help, got a new P-series from Vizio. Congratulations. Uh, connected to a new Denon AVR S720W. And when I use the SmartCast app to send something to the TV, then switch back to regular TV, I get no sound. Hmm. That's weird. Uh, hmm. Well, how are you... Th then the question becomes, how are you connecting the TV, the TV's audio to the uh, receiver. Are you using what's called ARC, HDMI ARC? Um, if you're using an optical cable, uh, then maybe I'd have to look into that. Uh, there could be a setting that gets changed when you do this casting thing, and then you have to go back in and, and reset it manually. And if that's the case, then boo on, on Vizio for making you do that. Um, uh, uh oh, looks like we're coming back pretty soon. If the human eye can't see greater than 4K, then how come we're going to see 6K, 8K? We're not going to see 6K. The next step will be 8K. And you're right, the human eye can't see that individual re resolution, but it does make artifacts less visible. So that's the advantage of it. Uh, Bob All right. Holtless. Out of time. Thank Out you, Scotty. Time. All righty. Have a great week. See you next Thanks. week. You Bye. bet. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about tech, computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, the good, the bad, the ugly. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. If you want to call and ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion, yell at me, help out a previous caller. 888 
877-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, outside those areas, say Australia, just call via Skype. We lo I love it that we have listeners all over the world. That's nice. 888-827-5536. Let's go to Adam, West Covina, California. Hi, Adam. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? Pretty good. I actually called a, a while ago, and I was asking about the MacBook Pro. I ended up getting it, and uh, now I want to uh, boot the MacBook so it can look exactly the same as my desktop. I always hear you talk about super duper. I mean, I don't, I don't know how it works, though. Yeah, I'm not sure that would be the ideal thing to do. There's always this issue of the desktop has different hardware than the laptop and so if you super duper the hard drive which will make an image clone of the hard drive that's one of the things super can duper can do that's bootable so you could super duper your desktop onto an external usb drive say switch that drive over to the macbook uh, and hold down the option key that's the trick on the mac when you reboot to choose where you're booting from and then boot to the external drive it'll boot because it's been made by super duper the problem is and it's more, this is more of a problem on Windows than Mac, but I think it would still be a problem here. You're going to have, I don't know, you try it and see, I guess. I, you know, because you're, you're using the operating system from a different piece of hardware. I'm wondering if it'll work. But on the other hand, I think the way Apple does these things, correct me if I'm wrong, chat room, but I believe is that there's drivers for everything. Apple doesn't have to worry as much as Microsoft does. Microsoft has to deal with an, a practically almost infinite universe of possible configurations. Apple makes all the hardware that Macintosh runs on, Mac OS runs on, so I'm, they can include all the drivers. I have a feeling this might actually work now that I think about it, but I've never tried it. So Super, what Super Duper is a, is a backup system. It's a very good backup system. It's everybody who uses a Mac should have a copy. Uh, what it will do is it will copy, synchronize folders from one drive to another. But what I use it for primarily is to make a, a bootable disk, an, an identical mirror copy of my internal disk externally. If you have an iMac or a laptop and the hard drive dies, the whole thing is no good anymore, right? you got to bring it in to get the laptop replaced unless you have a bootable external drive you can plug in and boot to that and it and the beauty of it is if you keep that drive connected at all times and keep super duper running it'll keep those two drives in sync so that it's you you lose no work time you you just switch right over to the second drive it's like having a mirror image of your internal drive so that's the idea and you can use it one time only uh super duper is free some of the uh, more advanced features uh, are not but i would try with start with a free version of it I'm I'm trying to think. I suspect you could do this. No, it, normally on an operating system, it's tailored to the hardware. So making a clone of the disk and moving it to a different computer would be fraught with peril. But but not in the Mac world. You know, you, Windows handles this by plug and play. You know, at the operating system when you boot up, says, "Oh, I see some new hardware. I'm going to download a driver, installs the driver." Apple's don't. Uh, I've never seen an Apple do that. My guess is that Mac OS has drivers for everything it might encounter already. So uh, go ahead and give it a shot. Everybody should have it. If you're a Mac user, you should absolutely have it. Charles Huntington Beach. Leo Laporte. Leo, thanks a lot. Thank you, Charles. I have a problem since I've upgraded to Windows 10 that's driving me crazy. Okay. Uh, generally, I use a lot of Windows Explorer windows opened at the same time. Yeah. And they're, they're all open with the different branches. Yep. And every time I pull... A USB device out like a like a hard drive. Every single window collapses. To I hate drive. that. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> and I, I have no clue why. I, I tried like on the Microsoft forum. They don't know. No one can help me figure this out. It's it's refreshed. It's refreshing those windows, isn't it? And it's because a new yeah. drive was attached. Windows says, "Well, that means all bets are off. I better just refresh all these windows." And in the doing so, they they eliminate where you've you've rooted them to. I would look for. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Maybe somebody uh, can help us in the chat room. But I would look for a way to create an explorer window that is rooted to a specific directory that starts at that directory. There used to be ways to do that. 
Um, let me see if I right click. You could pin it. So you you know one of the things that that Windows does now, which I love, Windows 10 and Windows 8 started doing this is these quick access. You know the quick access section, which looks like folders, pinned folders, but it isn't really. Uh, these are these are these are like library folders. So you could take a folder, drill down into your documents folder, right click it and pin it, either to start. Can you pin it? Oh. Uh, yeah, or you create a new library. It doesn't look like you could pin it to quick access if it's uh, not a, a root folder. But you can make a new library that you could then just open from Explorer. That would be one way, a little shortcut that would get you there faster. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretty easy thing to do, which I've done. But Yeah, I know. You don't, you've set it all up. Right, it collapses every single subject yeah. that I have open. How annoying is that? Yeah, every single time. Uh, there is also, of course, you don't have to use Explorer as your file manager. There are a lot of file managers that you can use for Windows that, you know, some of them may allow you to, to say, hey, this, when I say root, I'm saying this folder, this file window on the file manager starts at that directory. It can't go any higher. That's where it lives. Uh, and a number of these will, uh, will do that. So XY Explorer, Explorer Plus, um, there are a number of programs. Uh, remember the old Norton Commander? Everybody always says, oh, I miss the old Norton Commander, which was based on the Midnight Commander, or maybe it's the vice versa. There's a free Commander, which is a free version of that. That might be the way to do it. Multi-Commander, Explorer Plus Plus. These are all Explorer alternatives. Explorer Plus Plus has tabs which means you could, instead of having multiple windows set to the directories you want, you could have tabs. And in some of these cases, you can save these configurations for quick reopening. I understand, what you, I understand why you would want it to keep it that way. And I also understand why Windows says, well, you've mounted a new drive. we got to restart the whole thing. Yeah, it just seems odd that it started happening as soon as I upgraded to 10. Thank you, Windows 10. Well, they just decided <laughs> it's, it's the best way to do it. It's great. Have you looked? Have you looked at desktops? That's another. Uh, it won't solve this particular problem, but it might help. You can have multiple desktops on Windows 10. You know, workspaces. I've not looked at that. Yeah, I think that's a feature of Windows 10 that is really great. That a lot of people, myself included, don't use that much. Um, but look at the multiple desktops because. Uh, uh, also, somebody is telling me that there, if you get properties for Windows Explorer. You can create now. This is a kind of a weird way to do it. You can create a, a rooted window by changing the by creating a shortcut that's rooted. So you can change the target to a specific folder, and that way you can at least double click a shortcut on the desktop that will open that folder, reopen that folder right away. Another way to do that. I'll give it a try. Virtual desktops are really uh, nice. Um, and the, and it's they call it task view. It's, you'll see it on the taskbar. You maybe you've seen it uh, down on your taskbar. It, it's hard to describe. It looks like a triptych. It's like a box with two little boxes on the side. Play with that a little bit because that's another way to get around this. This is very common, unfortunately. Uh, you know, especially uh, it seems to be. Well, I think it's true on on Mac too. New versions of the operating system. Un break a lot of the things that we get used to doing. You know, you kind of get it in your muscle memory, and then they change it, and it's like, Arr! Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. Hey, thanks to the chat room. Uh, we'll put a link to uh, this article from Pop Sugar on uh, a dozen ways to print your your photos from Instagram. Actually, it's a baker's dozen, 13 of them. And one of them is the uh, the program I was trying to remember that I've used and I liked a lot. It's called Chat Books. And it's uh, $8 to make a hardcover book with 60 of your Instagram images in it. And it, it Chat Books is an, an app. You just put it on your phone. Uh, it's really easy to use, and then uh, you get uh, uh, you get these books, and they're you know I'll, I'll say they're not um, super high quality. They're they're books, 
But they look good. And the, the nice thing is then you have a little photo album you can put on your coffee table or you can put uh, on a bookshelf. And so I think if you had a bunch of Instagram photos from a trip or from a, you know, a special event like a wedding, it'd be kind of cool. So that's one. But there's literally 13. There's 12 more. And we'll put a link at techguylabs.com to this really good pop sugar uh, article. It's fairly up to date of all the different printing methods available to you. Came out about three weeks ago. Um, there are a lot of different ways. Social print, studio, postal pics, canvas pop, blurb. Blurb is the high price spread on that. But boy, blurb books look fantastic. I guess not that expensive. 15 bucks for a soft cover. Artifact Uprising, which <laughs> is a little odd. It, it prints on pine wood. Uh, or you can get wood block prints. That's that's kind of crazy. Insta goodies, chat books, sticky nine, which makes uh, little uh, refrigerator magnets <laughs> out of your photos. Image snap, persnickety prints, casetify, postagram, stitchagram. And I'd mention my uh, friend uh, Bill Atkinson's photo cards as well. It's what we use to do our Christmas card this year. And I really like photo card. That's available on iOS only, but it takes a photo, does it much higher. This is very high quality print job. Bill uses a super good printing service uh, for this. And then it makes a, a laminated uh, large, like, what is it, six by six by four? I can't, it's pretty big uh, postcard out of it that you can mail via U.S. mail. That's a photo card. So a lot of good stuff out there. A lot of ways to make prints. From your, uh, from your phone photos. Michael in Detroit, the Motor City. Hi, Michael. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. We've spoken before about the Acer R13. I recall you said you're a fan, and I know Father Robert also gave it a good review. Yeah. For your listeners who aren't familiar, it's a two-in-one convertible laptop with a really unique rotating hinge, ideal working, ideal for working with a digital pen. It's also more adjustable. So we should mention it's a Chromebook, right? It's not a Windows machine. It's no, no. It's a it's oh, a it's Windows or Core, Core i7 Windows. Oh, nice. Yeah, Windows 10. Yeah. Um, I love these uh, these uh, these Lenovo calls them yogas. Sometimes they're called two-in-ones. They turn in a laptop into a tablet by having a hinge that goes 180 degrees. I think that's really cool. Right. So this one competes with those other yoga clones, I call them. Yes. Um, this this is the one that has the rotating. It's called the Acer calls it the easel hinge. So it's more flexible. It actually covers the, it's the only two-in-one that covers the keyboard and protects the keyboard when it's in tablet mode. How does it do that? Oh, it, it swivels. It's right. It's, ah. it's the only one. That, right. So that's the one. I'm, just to make sure everybody's clear on, on what I'm talking about. So it, it basically it's it's the convertible two in one version of their S7. Yes. They're very high end premium. I loved the S7. That was uh, that was the laptop I had for a long time. Ah. Okay. So I don't know if you've if you've heard, but uh, Acer just discontinued the <laughs> Aspire R13. Of course I they just did. Found that out. Of course they did. <laughs> so I just found that out, and I'm really disappointed because I, I really loved this computer. I found it the most usable of any of the convertibles on the market, and I was certainly planning on getting a refresh once it's time to replace mine. I'm sure you've seen this happen with other products probably over and over again. Do you have any thoughts on why this specific Acer R13 failed? And then I have a quick follow-up question. It may not have failed. Uh, they may have uh, replaced it. You know, their, oh, Acer's been uh, doing a lot of uh, updating of their hardware and even of their mission. They, for instance, they they really wanted to abandon the very inexpensive, low-price stuff. I think, my guess is, and I have to look at this, that they've replaced this uh, R13 with the spin. Have you read about the spin yet? And it, it may, in effect, be an R13. Same idea, it's got... The swivel hinge, it's got the tablet thing, um, and it just may be that this is their new, it's a 14-inch screen, a little bit, maybe a little bit bigger, but this may be their new model of this, and they decided to rebrand. I'll have to look into the spin. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with the spin. I know. No, you wouldn't be. It's brand new, and uh, that's, that's the thing, is these companies are always, 
You know, there are companies like Lenovo that just go with a brand name and never change it. ThinkPad, Yoga, you know, they just never change it. Uh, and then there are companies like Acer that seem to be more interested to be more new models every year, new ideas every year, fresh and so fresh and thing. Yeah, no, I, I love the innovation. And Acer in recent years has, I think they've done, I think they're doing a very good job of rebranding so that they don't have that yeah. image of inferior low-end. They end, had the know, junk, budget. yes, exactly. They had the junk models that I really didn't like and didn't recommend. And then, as I, as I said, I had an S7. It was my favorite laptop until I got it, replaced it with the HP uh, Spectre 13T, which is an equally thin, beautiful uh, design. But, you know, I've never had one of the convertibles. That's the flips around one. And I'm so, I'm gonna get one. I don't. I just don't know which one. Well, I I highly urge you and any of your listeners, you know, maybe grab one of these really great deals on as Acer is clearing out. I've I've never been more excited about a product that I use every day, and I'll, and particularly a laptop like this. I I just think the art. What? Team, how do you use? How do you use it? Do you you like to use it in tablet mode? I do. I mean, especially if I'm like moving around from one place to another and I'm, if I'm doing something like let's say I'm recording your program right now and I need to move from one location to another. There's no easier way right. than to put the laptop in tablet mode and then, you know, travel to where, you know, move around to where I need to go and then, you know, uh, just open it back up and do some typing or whatever I'm going to do with it. The, the, uh, the easel, the easel hinge. So I checked with Acer and they told me they, that they have no plans at this time to reintroduce the, the easel hinge. The easel was great for working with the digital pen. Um, I haven't seen – I'm definitely going to look at the spin because that's, that's – It may not be – so the e, when you say easel, this, uh, do you, it looks like the R13, you can actually detach the keyboard or the uh, screen. Is that, the, is that correct? No. It's, see, I don't like detachables. This to me is much better. It's, it's, it's got a pivot in the middle of the screen. It has a hinge that comes up around the um, – Father uh, Robert did a nice review. You can see it uh, on, his, yeah. uh, on his review. I don't think the spin, despite its name, which would imply that it would also do this, has that same hinge. I'll have to ask Robert. He's, he's giving us a review of the spin this week, by the way, on the new screensavers if you want to watch it later this afternoon. So, uh, but I will ask him. Um, there may have been reliability issues with that particular form of hinge. I'm not sure. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Johnny, you look like you're uh, at the world headquarters of Johnny Jet Incorporated. His new office. You've got a map of the world behind you. You've got multiple laptops. Very fancy. Sent me this uh, microphone and webcam. And, uh, and now it's I not working. Yeah, it's I know. Too complicated. That's all right. Wake, I can hear it you fine. Work. That's fine. Okay, good. So, uh, Johnny. Johnny is a travel guru, johnnyjet.com. He helps us travel better through technology each week. I say that just so people know who you are, Johnny. That's all right. They need it. Who's this strange uh, man on the radio? By the way, I will be in Chicago next Saturday, so I might not be able to call in. I have to look at my time, but I'm speaking at the Chicago Travel and Adventure Show around this fun. time. I should go to those travel shows. I bet they're a lot of fun. Where you get speakers, you see different play destinations. Oh, yeah. They, they bring in Rick Steves, Samantha Brown. Oh, I love that. Uh, you know, you just uh, honored, we were talking last week about Arthur Fromer, who back in 1956 started writing the um, the Europe on $5 a day guidebooks. And I had mentioned that as a kid, when we went to Europe in 1967, I remember having uh, that guidebook with us. That is, he is, that is the 60th, it's now in his 60th year. Oh, he's the man. He usually speaks at these shows. Uh, his daughter speaking, Pauline, uh, with me next week. She'll be in Chicago as well. How old but is Arthur Fromer? He must be in his 80s. He's the same age as my dad. I think he's a year older or younger than my dad. So either 88 plus or minus a year. Do you, do you think you'll be traveling when you're 88? I hope so. I mean, yeah. my dad does, and I don't know how he does it. Cause, I hope you know. so. Well, that's what, yeah. you know, cruises are great if you're a little older. I want to take my mom on a cruise because you don't, mobility is less of an issue, right? Without a doubt. Yeah. I love taking cruises and river cruises, are, as, as you know, are really hot and they've never, oh. the prices have never been lower oh. thanks to all these ships coming in. The bad news is that it's all the ports they're going to are really crowded. So you oh. really want to go off peak. I do love yeah. river cruises. We're going on one to France in the fall, in late September. Oh, good. Yeah, well, speaking of France, yes. that's my website for you. Okay. I was going to ask you what your favorite city is. Paris. Paris. All right. Well, I know a lot of people feel the same way, especially my wife. So I just discovered this 
it's really a newsletter, not a website, but it's called mylittleparis.com. You look it up and then you have to hit the English button and it'll take you to a different website. But all you do is sign up to this free newsletter. It's really geared towards women, so I don't think you're going to like it. But I'm going to order it for my wife because it's really it's it's Lisa that that loves Paris so much. Same thing with my wife. That's yeah. her favorite. Yeah, that's her favorite city yeah. in the world. I love it, but it's her favorite. Uh, it's free. Supposedly, this woman who started up started this about eight years ago, just as a labor of love, because all of her friends would start emailing her saying, where, where should I go? What are your, you have the best tips and secrets. Yeah. And they're kind of like off the, off the grid and off the, you know, not the tradition, traditional uh, guidebook. Now it's a $42 million company according what? to. What? Yeah. What? And, and the newsletter is free. And I, I just described last week, I've received two, they give you two uh, newsletters a week, but you know, it's really girly. So I'm signing up. Because I'm really but, girly. No, no, I'm signing up for Lisa. That's yeah. awesome. I just signed so I up. Yeah. A lot it of says, female. you were born to be French, but accidents happen. <laughs> <laughs> Reveal weekly lifestyle secrets from real Parisians. Yeah. Why do we, why is it, why, what is it about Paris? It's an ancient city. It's beautiful. The culture, the food. The architecture. The art. And they are, I mean, I love walking, you know, walking along the river, Sen, and, yeah. and it's a great know, walking city. And one of my favorite things is just going to grab, going to um, get a, you know, a jambon and fromage sandwich, a ham and cheese. On a little this, baguette. Uh, just uh, yeah. Munch and that. Just wander through the Tuileries. All right. Exactly. All right. <sighs> all right. So that's my that's my uh, website for you, really a yes. newsletter. Okay. And here, here's an app. Have you heard of this one? It's called One Second Every Day. So the website is one s e dot c o. Okay. One s e e dot c o. Okay. So it's one second every day, and this was it started out as a Kickstarter, and I supposedly it had the most backers ever, over eleven thousand backers, and it costs four ninety nine for at least on iOS. It's on Android too, but I'm not sure if they charge for an Android. I feel like they want one second a day from me. What am I going to do with that one second? Well, it's really good for travelers. I mean, this is it's not they made it not even for travelers. They made it for everybody, just to show you to appreciate life and you know, it gives you prompts saying, you know, don't forget to upload you know, a, a second or take some video. Oh, so and you it, upload one second from a day as an as a video. And then yes. it makes it makes something it out of it. It stitches it together. It stitches it together, oh. and it'd be really cool if you go on a long trip, especially if you're going, you know, to multiple places, or even if it's just one place. But I really like the idea, and it has you know huge ratings, and uh, it is four ninety nine, but it looks pretty cool, and it's you know it's it's, it's you'd think one second wouldn't be enough, but it really yeah. is. And I'm looking at your, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm playing back the first one-second video. It's on their website. What, the number one, se.co. I'm going to do this. I like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, and you can do it towards, you know, you can pick the amount of dates you want to do. It doesn't have to be the whole year. You can just choose a, a week if you want. Right. But obviously, if you're going for a long trip, it would really make it interesting. And, and you know, this guy is just staying home, the one that you're reading right now. Yeah. So if, if, imagine if he was traveling. And I did see some that people had – that did have travelers that did have travelers and you know you could see the the planes flying and um it was interesting i, I i'm gonna try it out this uh, kind of ties in with my favorite photography tip ever uh from my friend ray maxwell who said when you're taking pictures especially on your travels but anytime um uh, every once in a while just shoot a few seconds of video you know, you don't have to worry about the sound. You don't have to worry about composite. Just shoot a few seconds of video. And then when you make your photo montage, you have a little video in there that just brings something to life. It's funny how video makes a brings. It's like you're there more than a photo. Fo a photo is a, is a moment in time that freezes everything. And so it's, it's a little unreal. Video is, is, is the opposite. It's like a little slice of, of reality. And so yeah. I like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I like this. I wish I'd started on January first, but I guess I can, I can miss the first, you know. 15 I like days I like and, that tip, but I, and I didn't even know about that tip. But I always take I video. I bet you do that. Yeah. And I do take I take short little snippets. Exactly. And it's really just more for me to to uh, you know remember that place. Well, that's the point. And all almost all cameras now, digital cameras, will take video as well as 
stills. So you're snapping along with stills. Do a, do every once in a while do a do a little uh, video in there. Throw a little video in. Without a doubt, and it's never been cheaper to travel. I mean, this week there's deals. You can go to Italy from New York on Delta or Emirates for under four hundred dollars round trip. What? You can you can go. Is it because it's winter? What? No, it's this off is season. This is up till May, and that's actually for two people. Emirates had this deal, and then Delta matched it. Um, but Helsinki, you can go L.A. to Finland for five thirteen round trip. Wow. And you know, speaking yesterday was Friday the thirteenth. I don't know if you saw that, but Helsinki has a flight six 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 to hell. Oh, to hell <laughs> to their airport code APL. I did see that. I was at BuzzFeed. I think they uh, they showed a picture of this flight taking off. Flight six 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 taking off on Friday the thirteenth. Yeah. Destination H E L, which is Helsinki. But wow. And he's and, and they plane, said and there are people on it. And their plane was thirteen years old. It didn't but no problem. So, so don't be superstitious, oh, okay? No, no. Yeah. Okay. You think For there's sure. anybody on board though who'd broken a mirror and and stepped in front of a black cat at, at any time? <laughs> then I'd be worried. Johnny yeah. Jet is at johnnyjet.com. You want to find the best travel deals? He has a great travels deals newsletter. It's absolutely free at johnnyjet.com. Also Fair Finders. And, of course, you should follow him on Instagram and Twitter because there's lots of stuff there, too. Thank you, JJ. Thank you. All the best. I love your new office. It lo you look <laughs> like a jet setter. Look at that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. Michael uh, is in the chat room. He said, you know what? I looked at the spin. It's not even remotely replacing the Acer R13. doesn't even have a backlit keyboard. Uh, he says, I think the R13 failed only because of bad marketing on Acer's part. If there was ever a product worthy of not becoming a dinosaur, it's the R13. So let me check. You know, Father Robert talks to them a lot uh, and see if what he knows about this easel hinge. It sounds, my guess would be if they discontinued the easel hinge, it wasn't because people didn't know about it or like it. I would guess that it was because they had reliability issues. Sometimes you introduce a new concept like that, that spinning screen. And uh, if people have problems with it, well, you're not going to keep doing it. It does sound like a really good idea. The one thing you might want to look at, uh, it's not quite the same, but the new, the new X1 Carbon Yoga that was announced at uh, CES this year, from th this is Lenovo's ThinkPad line. Think ThinkPads are really bulletproof business class computers. And, you know, all, everybody who makes these convertibles where you flip, the screen around so that it's a tablet and the, and the keyboard's on the other side has this problem, which is that you you didn't like, Michael, either, which is that the keyboard is now exposed. You can't put it down and start typing. Uh, the way Acer handled it, which was smart, which is you flip it around, but you're not flipping it on the other side. You're flipping it on the screen over the keyboard. So it's still turning into a tablet, but the keyboard is protected by the screen. That's sensible. And I have seen people make swivel hinges that, that do that, too. But the way uh, Lenovo decided to at least attempt to handle it is with a retractable keyboard. The keyboard pulls up into the body of the computer when you flip the screen around. So it is no longer exposed to the desk when you're using it in tablet mode. And and they, and we'll see if we can find there. There are definitely some laptops that swivel in other ways. I, I thought by the name swivel that that's what Lenovo was implying. Apparently not. But thanks for the uh, thanks for the update, Michael. Tim in L.A. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Tim. I'm Tim Callum. Carrion is T E X T P L U S and K I K. The best way to make free anonymous phone calls. And <laughs> okay, I don't know what he's talking about. How about uh, Fahar or Fakar? How is it Fakar in Bradford in the UK? Hello, Fakar. Am I saying yes, your name right? You. Tell me how you say your name. I want to pronounce it properly. I spoke with you a couple of times ago when I was in Islamabad. My name is Fakhir. There you go. I'll let you say it. I don't think I'll ever get it right. I remember talking to you in Islamabad. You're in the UK now. Yes, I am. I, I took your advice and I had uh, this last summer. I spent, uh, you know, most of my time, most of my vacation in Europe. And you, your advice uh, saved me a lot of money. Nice. I'm glad to hear it. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, because of the data and also with the Johnny Jet advices, which which you know I was listening a few he's minutes great. ago. Yeah, he's great. And about yeah, are you going to make your home uh, in the uh, in the UK? Or are you going back to uh, Islamabad? No, no, we uh, we moved here. I moved with my family, my kids, and uh, my wife. We moved here in Bradford permanently. Congratulations! That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. What can I do for you now? Uh, the reason for my call is to I have a couple of ideas, one for you and one for me. Okay. So I actually tweeted you uh, on Twitter, but. I suppose you have some kind of software, and you don't uh, read I, your tweets. I don't read Twitter so anymore. It's too, it's too uh, hard for me to understand what people are saying. It's like I feel like sometimes I'm reading Twitter. I feel like I've had a stroke. I'm seeing words. I understand the individual words, but when I put them into a sentence, it's nonsense, and I just I've given up on it. Not to mention the. Just the the general nastiness on Twitter. What I do with Twitter is I read the my feed. I just don't read. I don't read at replies. I don't read messages sent to me. Just I because it's just I can't. It's confusing, and it also and it often makes me feel right. terrible. <laughs> I don't like social media that makes me feel terrible. And increasingly, by the way, all social media is making me feel terrible. So maybe I'm going to go on a social yeah, media diet. You know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Do you know where I'm going with that? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it should be happy. It should be people sharing and enjoying one another, respecting one another, loving one another. Instead, it's just become a giant kvetch fest. Not yeah, even everyone, with our president elect, who can't seem to be he's angry about everything. <laughs> Everybody's sad and bad and failing. It's like I don't need that. I don't need it. So shiny, happy. You're a shiny, happy person. So what did you tweet me? And, and then that's the best way. Just call me and we can talk. We'll have a nice conversation. Yeah, because the, the idea which I wanted to give you as a thank you for the priceless services which you give to everyone is to make some money out of your show. <laughs> that was basically the idea. How do I make money out of this? Because. <laughs> OK, so uh, listen. The idea is to you have a lot of people, you know, calling you and giving you problems with different kinds of, uh, you know, brands and vendors. And what they do is they give you a lot of data. And being a vend being a you know entrepreneur myself, I have to listen to the problems of my customers when they are having problem with the services which I you know provide them. So you have that data, but you are not using it. So the idea is to have a software which probably you probably already have a developer in your team so you can ask him to develop a software which can basically make a database of the of the uh, of the problems which uh, you know people are reporting you time to time and what you can do is you can sell that data to the competitors like you know mike i would be interested to listen to the problems of my competitor what they're you know so that i can market uh, the problem is I can't really sell it because all they have to do is listen to the radio show, <laughs> which I think they might be doing anyway. No, no, what I'm saying is I know they, they are doing it with their own customer service. What, what, I, what I meant to say is the data which you are receiving from, from different callers, if you put that in the, in the database and you can, for example, you search for what are the problems in let's say in Lenovo or oh yeah like that's Super that's what or, all you have to do is go to techguylabs.com now I don't and I we we really don't want to save personal information about our audience uh, I I think that's a kind of a nasty trend also that's emerged on the internet is every time you go to a website they're collecting as much information as they can about you collating it using it to feed you ads we don't do that uh, but I, I do agree that we get a lot of information just from people who call and say, hey, I had a problem with this. And if, and if I were yeah. that company, I'd, but that's why there's a very good search at techilabs.com. Everything I say, everything we talk about, even the actual audio and video from the questions and answers appears on that website. So if you were Lenovo and you were curious what people thought, oh, actually, here's a better one. If you were Acer and, you, and, and you'd heard we were talking about the R13 and you wanted to get that feedback, you could go right there and it's freely available on the website. So, I, I do, you know, in a way that is right. there. I don't want to monetize it because, you know, I, I do all right based on uh, advertising. And that's, that's kind of how the 
how this model works. And I kind of like the model of advertising-supported free media. It's democratic. You can listen all over the world for free. I don't need to charge anybody. And I, and I don't need to take advantage of anybody's personal information. So I appreciate the suggestion. I understand what you're saying. It certainly is, you know, increasingly we're seeing that this kind of data is useful in so yeah. many ways. This, we live in the era of big data. And the only thing that concerns me about that is privacy. But uh, that's why we don't collect any information about you. That way we don't know anything about you. All right. That and we can't okay, share the idea, it. Second idea is for me, uh, and I want your opinion on that. One. Okay, good. And that is to help people to save some money on uh, on weddings. You know, on uh, as you know, the weddings are expensive. You have to save a lot of you have to spend a lot of money to make a wedding and uh, on spending on while talking about spending you also have to spend on on photographer right so the idea is to um, rather than spending 1000 or 2000 or 10 uh, 10000 depends on what kind of budget you have for the wedding you spend a lot of money on photographer so rather than hiring a photographer um, uh, i'm thinking to develop a, you know, a box like a photo booth where you can put a, you know, a digital camera, which is like a professional camera, like, uh, you know, Mark IV or Mark III, whatever the best available and add a printer to it and also integrate it with the internet so that uh, someone took a picture and they can instantly, uh, you know, print it and they can also share it with uh, with their you know with their friends and family. And that box can be rented out, or that box can be you know. Are you, you think uh, we're running out of time? You think you know. you're going to do this? I like this idea. Good luck. We're going to take a break. News at the top of the hour. More of your calls coming up. Our show today brought to you, brought to you by Blue Apron. I hate doing these ads at lunchtime because the Blue Apron makes me so hungry. I love Blue Apron. We get our Blue Apron box every couple of weeks with delicious meals. In it. And everything that's in that box is, uh, is fresh from local farms, fisheries, and ranchers all over the U.S. It's prepackaged to be exactly the right amount. You don't need a whole clove of garlic, a head of garlic. You just need one clove. That's what you're going to get. So there's no waste. And then it comes with this great recipe card. Tells you everything you need to know to make it. On average, Blue Apron meals cost about ten bucks per person. Uh, it's about, well, I don't know, considerably less. Grocery store is about sixty percent more because Blue Apron doesn't have to pay for you know all of that overhead with the grocery store. They ship it directly to you in refrigerated boxes. It's just a better way to cook. And you're going to try recipes, use ingredients you never heard of. You'll be a better cook. You don't have to be a cook to use Blue Apron, but after you do use it, you will get some confidence. You will say, oh, I could do that one again. <laughs> Spicy shrimp and Korean rice case with cabbage and furikake. Ooh, I don't even know what furikake is, but I will know after I do it. Pork chops and garlic piccata with scallion rice and spinach. Mushroom and chipotle pepper enchiladas with lime sour cream. These are, to go to the menu, you could see what's on the menu. You always get to pick what you want. So you don't, no surprises. They have plans for two people. They have plans for families with more kid-friendly ingredients too. So go to blueapron.com slash twit. Pick your first three meals. They're free with free shipping. Blueapron.com slash twit. Healthy home cooking. You know, I understand. You, you're tired at the end of the day. The last thing you want to do is go plan a meal, go shop for it, come home, make it, serve it. Who, nobody's got time for that, and that's why we all end up at Applebee's, right? Or worse. Those jack-of-the-box tacos sounding pretty good right now, right? No, stop the insanity. Blueapron.com slash twit. At least do this. Get your first three meals free, and you tell me. Seared chicken and mashed potatoes with kale, mushroom, and verjus. I don't know what that is. Oh, look at this stuff. And tell you, for date night? Phew. This is a good way to make a friend. Blueapron.com slash twit. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today, Leo Laporte, the tech guy? Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, 
smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. 888 827 5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. Uh, or Canada. Ellie, our friend from Honolulu. Aloha, Ellie. Aloha, Leo. How is, uh, how's the I... weather in Honolulu? Uh, it's very nice, but it's a little bit hazy. Hazy. Oh, that's the worst thing. You know. I hate they these seasons. Fog from the <laughs> volcanic mountains from the really? Big Island. Oh, neat. Yeah. Neat. But anyway, I have a sprocket. I got one for Christmas. Thank you. Everybody at Sprocket. What is Sprocket? That's the photo printer you were Oh, about, the Sprocket. The uh, Epson Sprocket. Right. What do you think? I like it. I think it's cute, and you could peel the uh, pictures, and you can put them on the backs of things, you know, put them on books, or you want to label something, you know, it's good. Now, it is, let me let me just look at an image of the uh, sprocket. Is it, uh, how big is it? Is it car it's, could you carry it around? Yeah, it fits in your pocket. A sprocket in your pocket. A spro well, that's probably why they called it that. It's it's the size about the iPhone size. Okay, and and what are the, and the prints? They're two by three. They're little. Yeah, they're very little. Um, and and how durable are they? Are they like Polaroids, where they start to fade, or are they are they more no. durable than that? Hello. Hi. Hi. Are how are the prints? Are they? Uh, no, they're pretty good. All right. Nice. And, and uh, as I remember, that one is... in people's wallets and stuff like that. Do you carry it around and hand them out like business cards? Yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. There you go. A, a, a recommendation from uh, an absolute ap actual user. Is it... Um, I have a question for oh, you. Oh, yes, go ahead. The, um, with Siri, I have a friend that dictates, and it never uh, quite reads the words correctly, you know, and I tell him... You know, it even reads uh, period instead of putting the period in. Is there a way you can correct it? Is there any kind of dictionary? Um, oh, that's a good point. Punctuation. You can actually say period. Yeah, he does it, but sometimes it writes the word period. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> Siri is a constant a source of amusement and uh, surprise. Uh, yeah, because that's what I do, and I, in fact, I've gotten in the habit, a bad habit, uh, of sometimes saying, comma, the punctuation in between, comma, the words as I speak them, period, which is really a bad habit to get into, because people think you're nuts, exclamation uh, <laughs> mark. I, I don't have a recommendation if Siri is seeing, the, when he says, period, as a, a dot, that's good. If, he's, if it types the word out, and I've had that happen to me, too, not just with Siri, yeah. but Google as well. Um, that's not so good. So, by the way, that's How not the, it's not that? an Epson, the, the Sprocket's HP, I'm sorry. That's one using the Zinc right. uh, ink, the Z ink, yeah. Pa right. Pardon me, I got the uh, make wrong. Um, I don't know of a fix for it, except to say it more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to fix Siri if she doesn't understand what you're saying. It's a, It can be frustrating, all of this stuff. Now, uh, I know something maybe some of the listeners don't know, that you're blind, Ellie. So you're very legally, yeah. yeah legally blind. So the, you're very used to the idea of dictation and having machines speak to you. And uh, uh, yeah, somewhat. Somewhat? Okay. Yeah, I mean it, it's just I don't it's not perfect. And it was always my knock against uh, using systems like uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking is, well gosh, yes, they're 95% accurate, but that means that one word in 20 is wrong. And uh, that's enough to be annoying. I had no patience with Dragon. Yeah. I really didn't. I think we're getting better, but, uh, you know, because I think Google and, uh, and Apple and Microsoft are all doing, and Amazon, for that matter, a lot of work on speech recognition, and, the, and they're getting better. Processors are faster. Memory spaces are larger. So they are getting better at it. And I do, and I've actually thought this for a long time, I do believe that the voice interfaces at least if for some of our computing, the interface, interface of the future, because it's natural. But uh, there's a difference between commands, which, by the way, also are often misunderstood, and uh, dictation. And dictation is a little more challenging because, uh, well, think about it. Um, a when you're making a command, there's a limited set 
of things you could be saying, you know, no matter which system you're using. And so Echo or Siri or Google or Cortana, they only have to understand, you know, a, a small universe. When you're dictating, it's the full universe of spoken word. And context becomes extremely important. And computers don't, un for all their appearances, do not understand what you're saying. They don't. The way they work is pattern matching. And that's why sometimes they'll type P-E-R-I-O-D when you just meant dot. Because they don't understand oh, the context at the end of a sentence. You do. It's obvious. It's the end of a sentence. Of course, period means period. But in terms of dictation, there are times when you might want to use the word period instead of the punctuation mark. And the computer isn't perfect at dis distinguishing the two different situations. That's really the bottom line. How do you make it better? You can't. In the days of uh, Dragon, naturally speaking, I, what days? is still the days. People still use it. You trained it. You remember training it? You'd read a bunch of sentences. In some cases, you can train. You can train your Amazon Echo. I, I know people know that. You go into the app and select training, and you can actually, uh, I think you have to say 20 different sentences. She dictates to you, and then you repeat them. Uh, I believe Siri is trainable. I know Google is trainable. Whether that improves recognition, I don't know. It's just hard. Now, Fred Bloggs uh, says, say full stop. <laughs> but will it type? It's not. It doesn't matter what you say because it's the same problem. Because the software has to understand, is this the end of a sentence? So do you want punctuation? Or is it a word? And it doesn't understand. That, it doesn't even understand what a sentence is. If you say exclamation point, most of the time, it's going to put a punctuation mark. And no, you don't say question mark. It knows. How often are you going to say what's question mark spelled out? Very rarely. Period, though, is not quite so obvious. And that's, that's why it's difficult. And the only thing I could think that would make it better, perhaps, is, uh, is a, little, a little training. Aloha, Ellie. Great to talk to you. James is on the line from Santa Monica. Hi, James. Hi, Leo. Thank you very much. Well, um... I wrote a film and I produced it and I played the lead in a, in a movie and we shot it at Fox Studio in Baja. Cool. And yeah, and I financed it myself. It was a wild dream of mine. And it's a PG film, you know, there's uh, no sex and no profanity in oh, it. Oh, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, uh, anyhow, the, uh, I, I have uh, a trailer, two trailers on on uh, if you google eight the number eight days d-a-y-s and the name carlo c-a-r-l-o anyhow my question to you is how what would be the if if let's say it was subjective to you how would you promote this film well you started very well you get on a radio show and you give it a plug uh do that as much as you can um it's difficult this is the thing that's changed in the world uh we can all make movies or make print magazines or write articles or do radio shows we don't i when i started in radio you had to persuade beg cajole trick somebody into letting you on the air and only you know only wealthy people own the transmitters and the station and the all of that stuff. Now anybody can make a podcast. So all, you know, writing a book, you can publish, it's easy to self-publish a book. The one thing that the music industry, the TV industry, the movie industry, the radio station, the TV station provided was marketing, publicity. And it's the hardest thing to duplicate. Um, I'll give you some hints when we come back. We have to take a break. But I will, I do have some ideas for you. Leo Laporte, The Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 88, 88 ask. Leo, marketing is really the challenge now. Um, it's easy. We've democratized, you know, the means of production. It's easy to write your own book, publish it yourself, make your own movie yourself. Uh, but how do you get word out? In fact, it's harder to get the word out, not only because you don't have these marketing machines. You know, in the old days, if, uh, you know, you were Leonard Skinner and you made an album, you could bet that the record label would go around state radio to radio stations and say, hey, can you play this song? And they, you know, they have a variety of ways of encouraging the DJ to play some songs, some of them legal, some not. Uh, and and that's how you got 
you got airplay, you got attention. Everybody listened to the same things in those days. So you could you could make a record a hit. But you don't have the record company, you don't have that clout. Nobody's listening to everybody's listening to different things. There's no communal, you know, media anymore. And there's a million more records, a million more movies, a million more books, a million more. Ma it's uh, it's exp it's a content explosion. So how do you break through the noise and get attention? Well, I mean, step one to make something good, right? I think ultimately, uh, and this may have always been true, success is created by creating something that people like and tell their friends about. Word of mouth has always been the best marketing, always. So the the trick is getting that f those first thousand people to hear it. That's the the number, by the way, that's commonly quoted by experts in the field. You need a thousand people. If you get that first thousand, and what you made is good, then they'll tell enough people that it'll snowball. That's what you're hoping for. That's or sometimes we could say go viral. They share it with their friends. They tell their friends, and. You know, Hollywood has still has a publicity mechanism. There's magazines, there's reviews, there's ways to promote stuff. There's awards shows. But as soon as you leave the mainstream and you're making your own movie, the, you got to get that first thousand. And that's a lot harder. You got to do it, I think, you got to do it retail. You got to go to the audience, find out where they would be. What's your movie about? Where do people who are interested in that hang out? Go to those forums and there's groups social media is a huge platform and very valuable of course you get your trailers on youtube that's that's a obvious that's a no-brainer but just getting on youtube doesn't do anything either because how do people know you exist you got you're giving you got to make it easy for people to see the trailer of the movie but then you got and then you got to and shareable by the way which is great about youtube people will share that link on twitter and facebook and other other places and so more people will see it but how do you get those first people to see it and that's just retail that's just pounding the pavement and I don't care if it's a presidential campaign, if it's a best-selling novel, or if it's a movie. It all starts at the ground level, going out, shaking hands, telling people, meeting people. Find that audience and get, get those first thousand people. And then hope you made something good enough that they'll spread the word. There's no shortcut to this. We don't anymore have the record labels, in most cases, or the studios or the publishers to help us. Truth is, unless you were a big shot, they didn't help you anyway. Leonard Skinner got promotion, but my new folk album isn't going to get any promotion. Um, Danielle Steele's novels are going to get promotions, but I can tell you, I've written 13 books. I never did a book tour. <laughs> what was that? you got, you got to find ways. Now, I think, that, I think the internet gives you ways to do this. Uh, and you, you know you got to be creative. I think about, I mean, and I mean really out of the box creative. I think about my friend Philip Kaplan. His handle is Pud. He uh, is a, was a genius in promotion, self promotion. He liked creating websites that would create revenue and kind of run themselves. His best known, I can't say the name on the radio. Uh, messed up company. It was a collection of. It was a website with a collection of internal memos from poorly run companies. It was hysterical. It was wonderful. This is maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and, of course, the trick on this is if once you get people to start submitting these memos from their bad company, the, the site does itself. It runs itself. You just got to get that started. And the way Pud did this, I remember him telling this story, is he would go to other websites and forums and say, have you seen this site? This is appalling. This site is terrible. Can you believe what they're doing? They are sharing memos, internal secret company memos to put their company in the worst light. I cannot believe this is allowed. Now, if you saw that post, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to click that link, aren't you? <laughs> it's very effective. I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I'm just saying you have to think out of the box. And Pud is a genius at this, and he, of course, made a lot of money. With that and many other sites that, you know, he thought of interesting and new ways to promote it. Not sure that's the method I'm promoting, I'm recommending, but but it's it's things like that. you got to think out of the box. And, and by the way, the chances are if somebody's already done it, it's lost some of its potency because people figure that out. you got to find the next way to do it. Oh, no. 
Oh, no. YouTube, what, how many, uh, somebody's asking in the chat room, Mark Chandra's asking in the chat room, how many hours of video are uploaded to, to YouTube every second? It's an, it's, it's, it's an astounding number. It's growing all the time. And I would bet it's hundreds of hours every second. It's impossible, in other words, impossible for anybody to see everything on YouTube. There's a lot of noise you've got to rise above. Challenging. But it starts, I firmly believe, with making great content. Because if it's, if it's good, I think the cream rises. Maybe I'm a Pollyanna on this, a, a blue-eyed optimist, rose-colored glasses. But I do think if stuff's good, it'll 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 people will will share it. They'll say, "Boy, this is great." If it's it's if it's funny or it makes you cry or both, and people really identify with it, they're going to tell their friends. So that's why that retail method works. You got got to get those thousand people to see it, and if they love it, you're done. Uh, latest figure from Fred Blogs: 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. <laughs> Don't, you know, you, there's no way you can find it all. And the other thing people sometimes rely on, and this is hit or miss, is, is for Google to promote it on YouTube or Apple to promote it on iTunes. Certainly as a podcaster, I do a lot of podcasts, when Apple puts you up front and center editorially on the iTunes page, that is gold. You can't get anything. But that's also kind of a gamble only a few things get promoted that way by google or apple or whoever and and relying on that probably isn't enough and even then they probably won't see it unless you get those thousand people first you gotta do the work first 8888 ask leo the phone number if you want to go to our website that's a great place to add your two cents on the comment section at techguylabs.com this is show 1300 54 in a continuing series as we try to unravel the conundrums of the internet, the conundra of the internet, figure out what this whole new world means. It is, it is an amazing world. Oh, good. YouTube facts. When we come back, somebody's found all the YouTube facts. We'll, we'll talk about it in just a minute. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls too. So uh, there's some debate over how many hours of video are uploaded on YouTube each minute. They used to give out this statistic pretty routinely. Um, and it's they haven't of late, but it's a lot. Let's, let's say it's a lot. The last time they said anything was last July. Uh, YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki said that 400 hours of video were uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's a, a thousand days worth of video an hour. <laughs> that means it would take you three years to watch every video uploaded to YouTube every hour. So you, you can't keep up, right? But there are statistics YouTube gives out. They give out statistics that are, of course, the most beneficial to them. For instance, YouTube has a billion active users that's about a third of all the people who have internet access total every day people watch hundreds of millions of hours on youtube generate billions of views the most viewed video last time i checked was uh that oppo gangnam style that really went crazy two and a half billion views the most viewed video that isn't music charlie bit my finger that's still almost a billion 833 million views eh, you know and uh, no one really knows how youtube counts a view if you because they don't really give that information out it's a lot half according to youtube half of all hits to youtube now come from mobile devices that's a big shift people have gone everything's gone mobile 76 languages 88 countries the number of channels earning six figures or more on YouTube is up by 50%. This is the number. These are the numbers YouTube likes. They want to give out these numbers because they want to encourage more people to put content on YouTube. Most of the time, you don't make money. You should really understand that. They say it's up by 50%. They don't say up from what. Maybe it was eight people and now it's 12. I don't know. 
We don't know. They have paid out $2 billion in advertising since they started in 2007. So that's not as much as it sounds like when you divide it by 10 years, is it? YouTube is, there's no doubt, is the king of the video platforms. In fact, you know, kids spend an average, everybody spends an average of 40 minutes. The minute you click into YouTube, you're going to be there for a while. That's more than television. It is the tell. I, when I look at my, my, uh, my kids in their 20s, that's what they watch. They don't watch TV. They watch YouTube. So uh, if you're a filmmaker and you want publicity, get on YouTube. That's the first thing they should do. Jill in Los Alamitos, California. You're next. Hi, Jill. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking the call. Thanks for calling. We just have a question for you. My, both my brother and I were curious to get your input as to what could be happening. I'm in Southern California, and we get our TV over the air via the old, old school uh, antenna on the roof. Nice. So we have HDTVs. We have two newer Samsungs and one couple-year-old Vizio. That's the, by the way, like the best quality HDTV is over the air. It's the least compressed. We love it because I don't yeah. watch TV that much, so it just makes a lot of sense. But yeah. um, as of last Wednesday, and it's been kind of rainy and stormy in SoCal, um, all of a sudden Channel 2 and 2.1 are, are not playing. It said weak or no signal, and when I ran auto programming, um, it eliminated it completely. And these are on my two Samsungs, yet my mom's Vizio does get Channel 2 and oh, 2.1. One of the and things about digital, that, too. one of the things that's unusual, in the old, remember the old days where with analog TV up to a few years ago, the signal wouldn't go out. It would just get f ghosty or there'd be lo rolling lines that get wavery. Remember that? Right. It doesn't happen anymore because digital, the, one of the properties of digital is it either works or it doesn't. So you don't get all the weird artifacts. How, how long has it been since you adjusted the rolling bars on that TV set? Remember the little knob you turned? Oh, my God. Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> how long has it been since you've seen ghosting? Remember, you'd have three people, you know, you'd be watching Hawaii Five O, and there's three Danos in there. That Those days are gone because it, it's not analog anymore. It's all digital. But the bad thing about digital is if it doesn't get a signal, it doesn't get a You know, if you can't get enough signal, it just drops off. So what you're probably in in what they call a shadow or a, 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 an edge area where channel two is right on the edge of what can work. Um, and so the sensitivity of... Now, your mom's TV is on the same antenna? Yeah, they're all on the same antenna. And she's got... But hers is a Vizio. And at my brother's house in Huntington Beach... He's got a Samsung and a Hitachi. Oh, but he's on a different antenna system. It. Yeah, and so, he doesn't get it. And I even but that's with but that's a, yeah, you, you, that's apples to oranges because it's it's it really has. So you're so if you go to a site like TVFool.com, that's a good site for this, <clears throat> and enter in your uh, zip code, you'll you'll see where you're probably getting your signal. I don't know where Channel Two comes from. Probably from Mount Wilson, but you're getting mm -hmm. your signal from an antenna uh, on a mountain somewhere. And you're right at the edge of, of what works. And you're close enough to the edge that either a, di a slight distance, like your brother's house, or attenuation in the antenna cable from the antenna to the TV can make the difference between getting it completely and not getting it at all. But why would mom's TV get it and my two Samsungs not? Could and be, they're all in the same house. Could be Well, it could be there's a difference in sensitivity in the tuner. Yeah, that's, um, that's one possibility. It also could be mom's is closer f physically, you know, has less cable because as you know, maybe that the cable attenuates a little bit. In other words, it's it's it could just be so close to the edge that she gets it and mm. you don't. So um, and the storm could have done a few things. It probably slightly moved the antenna. And so when you're yeah. on the edge, even a little thing like the antenna being at a different angle, slight different angle, would make a difference. So Do you think it would help to get somebody to go on the roof yeah. and try to move it? Repoint your antenna for sure. If Because <sighs> it, it went out with a storm, right? And it hasn't come back it, since. It seems to be that way. And somebody on Nextdoor.com said that she had the same thing. But I don't know what brand of TV, not that. Well, and you can also TV call, you could call Channel 2 uh, and, and say, has anything, have you changed anything? Because it may right. be that they changed something too. 
Now, would if I I've seen these like WineGuard makes an ultra low noise TV. Yeah, yeah, antenna. a better antenna will help. Yeah. And that's well. This isn't an over the roof one because I I would. Uh, well, the I've, roof is always going to be better than anything that's inside. And that's what we have. But if I got an indoor amplifier to use on my TV, right on the Not, back of the TV, would that help? It could. Yeah, I can't. I can't say for sure. Right. Of course. It could. Um, you, I, I would. I would make sure that the uh, the antenna is exactly. TVfool.com will tell you exactly how to aim that antenna. Oh. So okay. it's very useful. I'm there right uh, now. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of different things that could contribute to this, but the thing to understand is that you're right on the edge of getting it and not getting it, and there's no middle ground. So no. <laughs> so maybe 1 dB difference in the signal strength is enough. Maybe her TV is just a little bit, the tuner's a little bit more sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, may, maybe it's not an antenna issue. Maybe it's a cabling issue, right? Yeah, it's all the same cable. Well, but no, it isn't because it splits off oh. to go to your mom's TV and your TV, right? Yeah. In fact, I was wondering, I've, um, in doing a little bit of research about this, um, would like a high-quality cable? It could very well. It could be the, the go down there and check the connection. Maybe it got a little loose. Maybe some water got in it. There's all sorts of things. And if it's just this close... Any one of them could make a difference. That's why it's so it's hard to di to diagnose, and it's why the other channels are working fine because they're stronger, they're closer. So I would I would look at your cables. I would look at your cable, and getting a better cable might make a difference. Absolutely, and it may be I don't know. I haven't checked. Maybe the Vizios are more uh, sensitive. It's possible. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If it's air core cable, Chumley says you can get water in it, and that would definitely deteriorate it. So. Water in the coax cable, believe it or not, maybe it is, Jill, maybe it is tied to that storm, maybe water in the cable. Hmm. hmm. Thank you. See, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but you could see how a slight difference might be uh, all it takes. Yeah, it's a needle in a haystack, but it I'll, is. I'll keep trying. Take a look. I would, Judge Judy. <laughs> I, would <laughs> I would definitely check the uh, cabling uh, to your TV first. Yeah, or a okay. bad splitter. Yeah, that's what my brother said. So, um, but it's weird now. That now, I, I would check with because KCBS because Scooter X in our chat room is saying, with a quick search, he's noted that a lot of people are saying there is an issue with KCBS over the year. Because <gasps> I googled that first. I right. That if there was an issue, you'd see a lot of data on that, and I didn't see hardly anything. Well, so, but then my brother and another lady on next door. I'm like, okay. Maybe it is. I would call Channel Two and say, Hey, you guys having okay. problems? I'm an They're a, supposed I'm an to tell you that. Their chief engineer is supposed to answer calls and tell you that stuff. Okay. Whether well, they will is so another much. matter entirely. But <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> They're supposed to help you with that. Well, thank you, sir. You have a blessed day. Oh, you too. Thank you so much, Jill. All righty. Bye-bye. Take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK. Leo, I can't believe it. Have we come to the end of the day? Am I wrong? Shouldn't Dick DiBartolo be on the line right about now, if, if I got that right? I'll tell you what, let's take a call and we'll see if we can get... Oh, here he comes. Here comes Dickie D. <laughs> My, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, the Giz Wiz, the guy with the great gadgets. Every week he joins us and uh, tells us something, something cool, something exciting, something new. Hello, Dickie D. Hey, Leo. I thought did you, you were going to be it? here today. I'm so glad. No, did, did you figure out a way to watch a holiday? I forgot. In? Oh. I'm so mad at myself. We're both okay. subscribers to this crazy uh, cable uh, service called Broadway HD, and I did it because they uh, were do they did a live broadcast of a Broadway show. She loves me, but it was on there last yes. week, right? And now, yes, as and the same with the holiday. Holiday Inn. Inn closes. They did a live broadcast. What was that? Yesterday? No, it's it's tonight. Oh, it's tonight. Oh, That's why I'll no see you later, Dick. Days. Thanks. Uh, take, take over. <laughs> no, wait, you're finish, on. Finish, you're finish on, man. Radio. It's your show. <laughs> Oh, it's tonight. Oh, I thought I forgot. It's I thought tonight. I missed it. No, 5 no. p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Now you could just buy no, no, the 8, 8, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. It is 5. Yeah. Of course, it's showtime. Right. It's, it's Broadway show time, so Theater. Is, yeah. It's kind so of you good. Can, they they did a good job of the uh, she loves me. I mean, you really oh, was it wonderful. Was, it's amazing. It was great. Yeah. So you can subscribe to just the one show tonight. How much is that? But uh, you can get 
you can buy a one month subscription, so it's fourteen ninety nine. Okay, I foolishly did a year thinking, oh, there'll be lots more. Yeah, but, but Broadway a shows month, are reluctant. You can watch everything, right? Yeah, exactly. Broadway shows are very reluctant because they don't want to cut into ticket sales. Exactly. So that's why they do it the night before the show closes. Well, I do. I mean, and of course, White Christmas. I mean, Holiday Inn has to close because, well, yeah, Christmas is over. Is Bing oh. is Bing Crosby in that one? Because I love him. He he's still in it. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> Oh, he's a little, I understand his voice is a little on the weak side, <laughs> and they do roll him around. Oh, boy. So, Mr. D, you always bring us some fun stuff. I know you're just back from CES. Yes, the yes, Consumer yes. Super Electronics Show. It was a fun show, right? Oh, it was a fun, it is. It's bigger than ever and more stuff to see, but uh, I found some neat stuff. And do you know, you know about Kangaroo, the company that makes these miniature Window 10 computers? Oh, I have one. Oh, okay. Well. I love these. Wait, it was 99 okay. bucks or something. It was crazy. Yes. Okay. Well, now they have Kangaroo Notebook. So, Leo, this is pretty neat. So, the notebook itself is an 11.6 uh, HD screen, and but it, there's no computer in it. Oh, you well, have that saves you a lot of money, I find. It saves you a lot of money. Yeah. So, Leo, then it comes with two kangaroo minis, which are they, like the size of a Hershey bar. <laughs> And each one, of, each one of them is a Windows 10 PC. Crazy. So this way, the parents have their own PC with all the files on it. And this little uh, slim uh, Windows 10 PC has a 510 gigabyte slot in the side. What? So all your programs, all your files are on that little mini. So it's a so dock, it, but it's got the storage on the dock, so you don't have to... You, you can take a different processor and put it in there. Is that right? It, well, so you, you get two of these with it. So one you get two with it? Each person yeah, gets one, their own. Exactly, exactly. So they won't fit in any other machine, but the thing is here, if you don't want anybody to be looking at what you've been typing take it with or you. looking at your files, yeah. you take it with you. What the what? And it, and it's three hundred dollars. Wow! It's the uh, Adam uh, Cherry Trail. Yeah, it's not a super and fast processor, but more than adequate. No, no, more no, than adequate. No, exactly. I, I watched some videos on it. I was on YouTube on it. I did some searching on. It. You're not going to do gaming, and you're not going to do video editing. Yeah, it's only two gigs of RAM. It's uh. It Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But then you can add the storage capacity is 32 gigabytes. But then you can add your 512 gigabyte card. Wow. There's also a card reader in it. There's no video out. That might be a down for some people. Uh, and I happen to go on um, the website, and it is on sale this weekend for 269. Wow. At um, Egghead. What is that company? Egghead. A Egghead, yeah. yeah. Egghead has a 269 today, tomorrow, and Monday. The Kangaroo Notebook. Notebook. You know, this is uh, the company that makes this is in focus. They make the the yes. PowerPoint projectors. I know a lot of people have used them. It's a, it's a reputable company. It's not some fly-by-night thing. No, absolutely. No, this is and I, And I loved my Kangaroo. I thought that was really cool. I could even use it with an iPad, which was kind of neat, as the screen. Yes, you but can. But this, is, this provides its own screen now. Its own screen. Wow. So this is, you know, if I you don't it. know if the kid's going to like computing, an easy way to do it. You'll find Dick D. Bartolo at gizwiz.biz. That's his website, G-I-Z-W-I-Z.B-I-Z. -I -Z -I -Z. He's also uh, the host of the Gizwiz podcast at gizwiz.tv. Yes, sir. And if you go to his website, you can find information about the kangaroo and all the other products he mentions. When you click the link, the Gizwiz visits the tech guy. Below that, there's another little link that says... What the heck is it? And it's a fun contest. Look at a gadget. See if you can figure out what it is. There's 12 autographed Mad Magazines for the right answer. 24 for the cleverest wrong answer. So be wrong. You have a better chance of winning. <laughs> it's the only contest I know where really you, you do better if you're wrong. Yeah. I wish they played Jeopardy like that. <laughs> I would be a millionaire. I would be so good. Yeah, uh, I would get my name wrong. What is the seat of my pants, Alex? <laughs> You're right. You're wrong. You're right. That'd be a good game show. No, let's, let's sell it. No, uh, it'd it's be so terrible. easy to sell game shows. It'd be a terrible game show. It'd be no fun at all. 
Uh, anyway, thank you, Dickie D. Have a thank wonderful you, weekend. We'll see you for the Giz Fizz right after the new Screensavers, which is right uh, after this you show. Won't. I'll be watching Broadway shows. Oh, that's right. Yeah. In fact, I won't be here either. <laughs> I'm at, I am at, I can't wait. I want to watch that. Is it a okay. good show? Do you know? Who cares? Uh, it got pretty. It, it got pretty good reviews. <laughs> Who cares? It's Who cares? It's, it's Broadway on my TV. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, pal. Take care. Thanks. Oh, can I get one more call in? It's Sue Ellen from San Diego. I got a minute. Hi, Sue Ellen. Hi, Leo. I'll make it quick. But first, I want to tell you, you're my favorite part of the weekend. Oh, you're a sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going on an 18 day cruise to Hawaii in February. Yeah, so you're sailing all the way out there, it sounds like. It's lovely. I'm looking forward to it. However, Wi Fi on the ship is 75 cents a minute. Yikes! Do not want to come home to 10,000 emails. Uh, it, would it be possible for me to use the personal hotspot on my telephone? Nope, or nope, nope. No, crap. You're in the middle of the ocean. You can't do anything. Now, when you get to Hawaii, yes. So as soon as you're on land or close to it when you're docked, your phone will work again. You can use it then. And, of course, you can always get off the boat and use, a, you know, go to a coffee shop and get Wi-Fi there. But one, but since you're sailing across the Pacific, no, at no point th then will that work. Well, that was not what I wanted to hear. I know. Uh, it's both the pleasure and the pain of cruising is that you often get disconnected from the Internet. And uh, for me, that's nothing but pain. Well, they do have Wi-Fi, but it's 70 Yeah, and it's and it's not worth it. Usually it's very, very slow. Yeah, that's what I figured also. Just well, enjoy the sun, the porpoises, the fresh air. Forget the Internet for a week. It's going to be... <laughs> no, you don't need those. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.